Today, we have a special session uh, of the Fred Jalinek series for which we have invited uh, engineer Tomasz Mikolov, PhD. Um, and I'm most, I'm very glad that he could um, accept the invitation. I, uh, there is a need to introduce him in more detail, but um, in any case, uh, he is a research worker of the in the Czech Institute uh, for Informatics, uh, Robotics, and Cybernetics at the Czech Technical University. Uh, he specializes in NI, machine uh, learning, and NLP, and um, in in uh, the years 2010 and to th till 2020, he worked uh, in the research centers of Google and Facebook. And in 2018, he received the prestigious prize of Neuron Foundation, uh, an innovation prize. And um, the most cited result of him uh, and his colleagues uh, was a paper uh, on the algorithm to uh, combat embeddings uh, that can be universally applied in deep learning uh, as semantic representations of words in the vector space. Uh, so, uh, we are very glad, Tomáš, that you could uh, accept our invitation. I, I am afraid it's mostly due to the COVID uh, epidemic, because otherwise you would be busy traveling abroad. But now we have you with us, and I'm looking forward to your talk on understanding language modeling. So, it's your turn now. Okay, uh, thanks uh, for the introduction and I would be absolutely very happy if I could uh, come actually in person to the Charles University just because of the current situation. It's uh, it's not do doable, so we will have to do it uh, remotely as this. Uh, so just feel free to uh, just interrupt me during the presentation if you want some clarification or anything because uh, I think it's uh, just uh, a bit more difficult to interact uh, with people uh, now that we are like uh, meeting this way. So again, like uh, just feel free to Tell me if anything uh, goes wrong. Uh, I did uh, share my screen uh, with you. So I hope that uh, you can see actually everything. So I'm just starting the presentation. And uh, if anything uh, goes wrong, then just uh, tell me so that I just uh, don't uh, spend like 10 minutes talking about uh, the presentation without you seeing the slides. Uh, so I hope everything is OK. And this presentation will be about like uh, um, hopefully a better understanding of the language modeling because I will be presenting my view of, on these things like uh, um, what were like the uh, key uh, like uh, ideas uh, behind statistical language modeling over the last uh, almost a century and that's of course my personal view and uh, I completely acknowledge that there are people who have different view and uh, who think otherwise but uh, I think it's uh, it's good always when people actually keep some diversity in the ideas so I will be presenting my version of how I actually think uh, that uh, things are moving forward. Uh, so as for the basics, uh, actually the language modeling is like very uh, like uh, rich and long history. Um, I would even say almost surprisingly because people were uh, thinking about uh, statistical models of uh, language early, already at a time when computers uh, didn't uh, really exist uh, yet. Like uh, like Claude Shannon who did, uh, uh, who did obtain the Nobel Prize for the information theory later uh, did go to uh, try to apply the information uh, theory to language uh, and he did uh, write this uh, very interesting paper about like uh, predicting symbols in, uh, in English and computing the entropy of the language. Uh, he used uh, back in, in his days like some very simple models uh, called engrams uh, which somehow turned out uh, to be uh, very very hard to beat and uh, it took many decades of research to really like uh, not only come up with some ideas that uh, work a bit better, but something that really replaces engrams in practice. Uh, so it was like very surprisingly uh, difficult problem to uh, invent uh, better better techniques for modeling the language. Well, Claude Shannon's estimate was that there are something like 0.7 to 1.3 bits of information per character in English, but uh, 
these numbers don't really tell us much because, uh, uh, well, as, uh, as you, uh, you can imagine, there's a lot of like uh, other choices that, uh, that you need to make, whether you make uh, all the letters uppercase, lowercase, if you discard some special symbols, if you count spaces or end of lines. Uh, characters. So I would say this is just very rough uh, number. And anyways, uh, people could uh, beat it uh, later, at least the upper bound, uh, uh, upper estimate. Like in my thesis, I think I did uh, get to some like 1.2 bits, uh, but uh, certainly with more data and uh, uh, bigger models, it would be possible to get much lower than that. So I think it was, uh, it was very uh, insightful work uh, in its time, and uh, it did influence uh, a lot of people. Later there, there was actually Fred, uh, Fred uh, Jelinek, who was uh, like inspired by by Claude Shannon's information theory and who did follow on his ideas about like uh, using uh, math uh, uh, and applying it to language uh, to really build some some models of the language uh, and that resulted in a lot of uh, like uh, famous uh, results like uh, uh, like everybody knows these days so the, <clears throat> the statistical models uh, of speech and uh, and language and uh, for machine translation like uh, many of these ideas were Either invented or like uh, hugely improved by by the group at IBM that was uh, that was headed by Fred. Uh, so I think that uh, that was uh, that was quite exciting to see uh, like uh, all these uh, amazing people who did work on this problem before me. There was also like a lot of people who did really see like even like AI behind language. Like uh, if we could build uh, some good models of the language, then we should be able to even like uh, answer like uh, like very uh, like. Uh, interesting uh, like uh, problems uh, let's say if you have a intelligent language model that uh, gives you a uh, probability of a sentence uh, where actually like uh, sentences that make sense uh, should be uh, having higher probability if you train on a corpus that actually contains the truthful sentences then they should have higher probability than the sentences that are false uh, so if we have, would have actually a really good language model not now i'm not talking about engram but really like some good language model then we should uh, be able to solve uh, problems like question answering simply by con concatenating questions and answers and competing their probability for different uh, variants. Uh, so actually there was a number of people who did, uh, who did call uh, language modeling to be AI complete. Like uh, there was, for example, uh, Marcus Hutter or Matt Mahoney who did uh, start like this uh, data compression uh, challenge where they did actually claim that uh, the one that actually compresses uh, Wikipedia the most uh, we like to build the best uh, best uh, language model and uh, and uh, that would be actually like getting more and more intelligent so i think it's uh, it's maybe like 15 16 years old challenge a lot day and uh, uh well we don't have intelligent language models but as you can imagine the the best uh, types of language models are actually winning in this challenge like uh, some regard networks and so on so that's uh, that's really cool there was joshua goodman who was also like uh, uh, seeing this AI completeness of language modeling. So there was a lot of like famous people who did see language modeling as something uh, actually like a, like a deep uh, research problem where there's actually much more hidden in it than it seems at first. Because what you will see at first, if you actually go to some class about language modeling, then uh, it will be these simple equations that uh, again, they dominate uh, this, uh, this research area for like uh, many, many decades. Uh, if you want to compute trigrams, you need basically yeah, like uh, these few basic equations. If you don't really talk about smoothing of the probabilities, which is uh, too many details for this presentation, but basically we just look at uh, how many times you did observe uh, words appearing together in some training corpus. So, uh, to give an example, if you would want to compute uh, uh, what is the probability that uh, after seeing words uh, New York, uh, the next word will be a city, then you will just look at your training data, which can be say English Wikipedia, and you will see that, for example. You did, uh, and there was like uh, uh, 1,000 uh, occurrences of uh, the bigram New York and uh, 700 occurrences of New York City. So the probability that a city follows New York is going to be something like 700 divided by 1,000, which is uh, like say 70%. Uh, so that's like a rough idea of these uh, trigrams work. Uh, and uh, uh, it actually sounds very simple, but uh, I think it was already like Lodge, you know, who did uh, uh, have this. Uh, interesting observation that uh, engrams would be actually optimal if we had uh, infinite amount of data and if the n actually would be infinite as well, uh, which I think is uh, kind of like almost like a philosophical uh, like uh, idea in a sense, like uh, you can think of the whole universe, whether there's actually a finite number of combinations of what can happen over time or 
whether the universe is infinite and the number of combinations is gonna like uh, continue like forever. So again, it's more like a philosophy, but uh, but still like uh, I think it's interesting to realize that engrams can be actually uh, pretty good. Uh, and again, like this was already observed in the mid of the previous century. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, that's not the end of the story because engrams again, as I said, like uh, it's a cool idea, but uh, but we believe we can be better simply because we don't have infinite amount of data. And typically, uh, we actually have training corpora that are just of some really reasonable size, of say like millions or billions of words, which is much much less than this infinity. And uh, uh, the humans are actually able to generalize even from much less. Uh, data than our language models like if you would look at uh, the amount of data that language models that are used uh, in say products like uh, say google, google translate or like uh, products uh, of, uh, of this scale how much data they are trained on it's like a huge amounts of data it's like uh, many orders of magnitude magnitude, magnitude uh, more data uh, than a human will be able to process uh, in whole lifetime. So actually, if you would uh, look at like some learning curves, it would look uh, kind of like this graph, uh, where actually, as you are increasing amount of data, then the engrams are slowly getting better, better, and, and so on. But the humans can actually do much, much better with limited amount of data than the engrams. So we simply learn more regular regularities from less data than the engrams do. So this kind of like empirical observation uh, that uh, goes back to Paul Chenow, who did see uh, that actually humans are better than the engrams, uh, and we can increase the amount of data for engrams, but uh, it's kind of like uh, fooling ourselves uh, that we are building AI while we are just building some some larger lookup table. So I think that uh, that's one thing to realize that uh, yes, we can train models on more data, but if we actually care about uh, building these kind of like intelligent models, then we should really think about how can we learn more regularities from some fixed amount of data. Well, there was, of course, like a lot of criticism for these approaches, like uh, I think maybe the most famous one was from Noam Chomsky, who did, uh, who did uh, make this claim that the notion probability of a sentence is entirely useless one under any known interpretation of this term, which, uh, which is certainly like very harsh criticism. Uh, he did even like give concrete examples, uh, what we can't actually ever solve with language models by forming sentences. One of them is grammatically correct, the other one is incorrect. But both of them actually contain bigrams, like just the words that are next to each other, are very, very unlikely to ever happen together in some sensible text. Uh, well, as it turns out, uh, if you use actually some, some better models of the language than engrams, say neural networks again, then uh, they will be actually uh, quite easily able distinguish uh, which sentence is actually grammatically correct and which one is more likely to occur and which one is not. I think I did even show this in my thesis. I don't exactly remember how much more likely the correct sentence was, but uh, I think it was like a thousand times maybe. So uh, so it was uh, actually, I think this idea from Noam Chomsky was, uh, was nice, but uh, certainly it turned out that uh, it can be solved by simply just building better models of the language. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, then, uh, as I said, there was a lot of researchers who did see uh, like uh, language modeling as something interesting and who did try to overcome the engrams because of, um, because of the known issues uh, uh, that uh, everybody basically did feel that uh, the engrams are so in advance that we should be able to do better. And uh, there was like a, a lot of ideas, but I did, uh, divided them into these few categories because I think that there's a little a lot of redundancy that many ideas have been reinvented under different names. So there was the word clustering, where we actually just say that, for example, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on, like uh, these days just describe very similar concept and just uh, are different in some slight way. So if you can actually cluster these words together in some way, uh, then you can build more like robust models that can see like uh, uh, that can form, for example, uh, like uh, longer engrams or like see more training examples because you will be not having so much variability that will be coming from say synonyms. Uh, uh, and uh, the other area was, uh, I will actually get back to the word classroom later, but uh, the other big area was the cache models where actually people observed that uh, uh, say names uh, in the training data uh, seem to kind of like occur together in some piece of text. Like if you have a Wikipedia article about some person, then it's quite likely that even that person's name is very unique. Uh, it will uh, like occur several times in the article, 
but it will not occur in other articles. Uh, so in other words, uh, the words can like trigger themselves to occur. And the simplest way out of this can be you know, like uh, approached in language modeling is that you will just build some kind of like a smallish model from the recent history. It can be even Unigra model from the last thousand words, for example, and you will interpolate it with, with your trigger, trigger model that's being estimated from all the training data. And that actually works quite well and uh, simple, to, simple to understand and implement. Uh, and of course, it has many different names because the cache models are like uh, very, very easy to replicate in uh, different uh, instances. Like there are topic models that are doing pretty much the same thing and uh, quite, a few, quite a few others. Uh, then there are like the huge category of these uh, linguistically motivated approaches where people would uh, uh, use part of speech uh, tagging or like a statistical parsers where uh, the idea was clearly like to overcome the limitation of the engrams that they see just uh, this very short history that uh, maybe we can actually use the, the like uh, uh, knowledge of the linguists uh, to incorporate them into a statistical language modeling and to improve uh, the models of the language based on the understanding of the, of the linguists. Uh, and again, like uh, many combinations of these uh, were invented. So there was, uh, for example, just to give a few examples, there was this WordNet uh, database where um, people would create a database of how words are related to each other. Uh, of course, like um, if it's for English, you may have a problem if you want to have the same for say Czech, uh, you know, always translate the words, but there can be some inaccuracies. Uh, uh, there are like the tree banks, uh, which again, like uh, were originally invented for the English or used uh, in the case of English. Uh, have like uh, other like uh, famous examples, like for other languages. I think one was uh, for Czech from the Charles University. Basically, the idea was that uh, you can annotate these sentences uh, and uh, uh, like by humans and create these uh, large databases and then try to build parsers that can actually do these annotations automatically and use this somehow to, for example, improve machine translation or the statistical language modeling. Uh, well, to, uh, to continue on this, uh, there was this, uh, in my opinion, like very insightful and interesting uh, technical report uh, from Joshua Goodman, who did actually take many of these ideas and he did just evaluate uh, pretty much all of them that he could implement easily and uh, uh, even combine them together to see which ones are redundant uh, and which are actually necessary in this combination. And uh, well, pretty much he ended up with, with, these, uh, with these approaches that I described that the cache and the, and the clustering ideas are like uh, the very important ones. Uh, however, uh, there was uh, this one negative part uh, of, uh, uh, or like one negative conclusion of his work, which was that uh, as you are increasing amount of training data, which you can see on the X axis, uh, then the improvements that uh, you get from these uh, various models over a baseline, which was just a trigram in its case. Uh, so it's actually not even like say five gram, which would be much more, much better, especially on the large data sets. Uh, then the improvements, improvements were actually decreasing. Uh, and then there was the conclusion that many people did make, I think even, even Joshua in his report, was that if you would have really a lot of data, then actually the engrams are just fine and you can't do better. And I think that was uh, kind of like depressing conclusion for many researchers. And uh, I would say like uh, when I started uh, myself as a student working on language modeling, I did see that uh, most of the people were just hopeless about the area and they did believe that uh, there's uh, not much to be uh, to be discovered in this uh, area. Like uh, even if uh, the whole community, not the whole community, but a large part of the community was uh, convinced that the engrams uh, can be beaten somehow uh, since like the days of, uh, of Chomsky and, uh, and Fratjelinek and, uh, and Klochen and so on. Then the practical conclusion was that uh, after all these attempts, uh, there are basically no hope if you use uh, large data sets, then just the engrams will, will work fine and we will never get this uh, human-like performance of the language models. Uh, so. That was it, but of course, like there was still more to come uh, because we didn't end up at, in 2001. And uh, actually there was like um, some other ways how to compute, for example, the clustering of the words. Uh, uh, typically, if you would use the uh, like old style clustering, say brown clusters, uh, then you would assign every word to a single class. And while it was working well, as, as Joshua was showing, uh, it was working less well with more data. And you can actually come up with the generalization of the idea. Maybe actually each word doesn't belong exactly to one class, uh, 
but maybe actually words belong to multiple classes and uh, and uh, even like it doesn't have to be probabilistic uh, the numbers don't have to sum to one maybe there's just some kind of like distributed representations of the words uh, which are just loosely related to this idea of like assigning words to classes uh, actually this is a, a figure like uh, after like many years when uh, i did train this word to vec model on uh, on some uh, data then uh, then uh, the 2d projection of the uh, originally 300 dimensional word vectors looks like this and you can always see sort of like what i was just describing that there is just not a single cluster of words you can see that uh, if you assign words into some like high dimensional space uh, then even if it's two dimensional only in this example but uh, but uh, you can see that there's a lot of like uh, similarities among words for example you will get like say some eastern uh, countries in one cluster and then you would get say central european countries in another cluster and the southern European countries in yet another cluster and that the capital cities are clustered in like a similar way just shifted in some direction and uh, there is actually like just um, the idea that each word should just belong to a single class uh, doesn't seem to be optimal by far here we can see that words are more like a rather like composition of uh, many different concepts uh, and just seeing, seeing them as uh, vectors in di high dimensional spaces uh, seems to be uh, both simpler and, uh, and better. And I would say that's, uh, that's what we observe at neural networks uh, because also neural networks have this uh, name that I think was uh, in the beginning somewhat annoying to people because it seems to be like pointing to some brains, to some biology, and uh, I would believe that we have to start a study biology to improve uh, our understanding of language, right? That sounds. Uh, bit weird uh, so I, I can understand why people like for example from from the nlp community were not excited about somebody like coming to them with uh, something called neural network but uh, uh well it uh, ended up working quite well uh these models started being used uh, quite successfully a lot of, like since 2001 i think uh, when yoshua benjo and holger Frank did publish uh, their work uh, was also, also like Ahmad Emami who did uh, publish a couple of papers at GH and later I, at IBM using uh, neural networks. Uh, but it didn't really like convince much of the research community. There was actually a lot of issues with these models. So if you go back and read the papers from these uh, years, like before 2010, you would find out that uh, like uh, none of them did, did actually open source working code. I think the only person who did actually open source some code was Holger Schwenk, but uh, for example, I never did manage to make it work, and I don't know about anyone who, who did. Um, the others didn't actually open source anything. Uh, then the results were not using any any uh, like uh, publicly available data set. So when I was a student myself, I couldn't actually compare to these guys because uh, I didn't have their data sets, and there was no way how to obtain it. And uh, also, like if you would really read these papers, you would find out that uh, all of them did struggle, like. Uh, then uh, the amount of data that go was say one million words uh, because the performance did drop, uh, but the training times were getting uh, like uh, very long, and the performance, the gains over n grounds were actually vanishing. Uh, um, so it wasn't actually looking that exciting, and uh, um, there was also like a lot of mistakes, which uh, which at the time, of course, nobody did know. But uh, there was a lot of myths. I remember when I was actually at uh, at Montreal at uh, Yosha Benchia's group. Uh, in 2011 at an internship i was there like for half a year and uh, <clears throat> i was talking with uh, with Yoshua and he was convinced actually back in the days that uh, that uh, uh because of the number of combinations that you can express with uh with uh neural network uh a hidden layer that is for example just 100 neurons uh, that uh, the number of combinations uh, uh grows exponentially with the size of the hidden layer that uh, he did believe that uh, we will never need more than 100 neurons in our language models, which, uh, of course, like from today's point of view, sounds ridiculous. But uh, back in the days uh, when nobody didn't know like how to train these uh, things correctly, and nobody did know the limits of what is actually possible, there was a lot of these myths that actually did. Uh, um, that was actually the real reason why these models were not used because they actually didn't really work because nobody did uh, have good implementations. Uh, then I did actually come with this. Uh, a recurrent neural network language model, which was like original in several ways uh, at once. Uh, I also did work on it like for maybe four years before I did publish it, so it wasn't actually that simple and easy as, uh, as it seemed to many people. Uh, well, mathematically, it's very simple. It can be described by a few equations, but I also did publish it together with uh, with uh, open source code. And uh, 
together with uh, uh, together with uh, the data sets and uh, it actually did work uh, better and better the more data you would use just it was slower and slower of course that was uh, the main issue and uh, in 2011 I did publish this uh, this graph which I think convinced finally uh, a lot of people from uh, from companies like for example Jeff Spike from Microsoft Research uh, who did, uh, later invited me for an internship uh, in his group uh, and uh, this graph basically shows uh, like the green line is the baseline where you have like the water rate on some difficult IBM uh, data sets uh, like speech recognition broadcast news. Uh, and then you see as you are increasing the size of the hidden layer, which is like the X axis, then the neural networks and uh, their combination with the engrams and some variants of them are working better and better. So clearly you can see that if you would have the computational budget to train even bigger bigger models then you can expect uh, even uh, even bigger improvements uh, and that was quite exciting exciting to a lot of people and uh, uh, of course like we know what followed like uh, we had last the decade of like a larger and ever larger models trained on more and more data like with all this gpt one two three four five and so on uh, so that, that was uh, that was uh, like obviously going to happen also like i can show this uh, this graph i tried to find the state of the art on this uh, Pantry Bank data set, which wasn't actually public before I did publish it on my website, but it was used by, by uh, students of Red uh, Jelinek at uh, Johns Hopkins University and uh, some of their colleagues from other universities who did uh, manage to get a copy of the data set. Uh, and you can actually see how big breakthrough these neural networks uh, and the ideas in these uh, neural networks uh, did uh, make around like uh, 2010, when actually the perplexity dropped by, by I think, 50% almost. Uh, uh, for the state of the art, uh, so it was like a huge improvement. Of course, like uh, it was, uh, it was before like uh, a task uh, that uh, not that many people did work on because language modeling that usually have just a couple of papers per year, I'd say inter speech or uh, ICASP, ICASP conferences, uh, and uh, it was uh, believed to be not uh, worth uh, like even the effort. But uh, after this this uh, huge improvement, there was this deep learning boom that we did see that. Uh, all the NLP conferences that jump uh, uh, to uh, work with these new lens. Uh, so back uh, to like what was uh, what was important. I would say neural networks are certainly not anything about the brain, but it's a uh, just better version of the clustering. Uh, uh, it's not just clustering of the words, but actually clustering of the histories. I think it's even more obvious in the recurrent uh, uh, neural network architectures that uh, you don't want to just put. Uh, the, the words with similar meaning into uh, the same class or similar class, uh, but you want to actually cluster the whole histories. If you just shift a few words here and there, then the histories can make uh, exactly the same sense and you want actually to share parameters among them. And that's actually what the neural networks can be doing uh, as the mathematical models. Uh, and then of course, the obvious idea is to use big data sets and big models. Uh, in my thesis, I did show that, they, uh, that the improvement that you get over the engrams is increasing with the amount of data which uh, was like uh, very surprising at its time and uh, i think it uh, got a lot of people excited about uh, the potential of these models and uh, from my current point of view it was completely critical to open source uh, the code and uh, have the public data sets because otherwise the progress would be much much slower uh, when i did for example uh, get a job uh, at uh, google brain uh, when i joined google no, I I did find a lot of couple of people there who did uh, spent like months by re-implementing my code into Google three, which was like the internal Google code base, uh, and uh, that would not happen if I would not open source it. And uh, it was similar at Microsoft Research and IBM and uh, a couple of other companies uh, that were actually starting to work on uh, recurrent networks and uh, neural language models uh, by just downloading my code and uh, planning out to things how to do things from there. So. That's the, that's kind of like for the history and what worked and uh, to explain that uh, like uh, what uh, what uh, ideas that are important in this uh, language modeling research, uh, but uh, um, what what can we actually do further so that uh, we would get closer to this human performance? Because even if neural networks are better than the engrams, as I was showing in the in the graph in the first uh, the first slide, uh, like a uh, year. If you would think of neural networks, they would be kind of like somewhere between the green line and uh, the green curve and the red curve, uh, but they certainly are nowhere close to the human performance. So there still is much uh, that we can do to, to actually 
get uh, get better. And the question is, how do we actually get there? How do we invent some new models that would be beating the current version of the neural networks? Uh, and uh, uh, which models can actually learn more regularities from the data than the current ones? So, well, of course, that's a that's a big question, and I will present. Uh, the rest of the presentation, a couple of ideas. So I am approaching it myself. Uh, of course, the easiest approach how to get better results is to train larger models and more data, which seems to be like a, the never ending story. And I, I think we will see uh, like uh, this again and again for like the uh, next couple of years. Uh, but, uh, but back to like these learning limitations, uh, there are actually some very simple tasks that we can define. We can construct some, some, uh, some like, uh, uh, data, even algorithmically, that contain regularities that uh, uh, the typical neural network uh, models uh, don't really learn to capture. Like one, like a famous simple example is uh, is this A and B N example from like a, from the computer science uh, uh, like type of research. Uh, yeah, you can't actually uh, describe this regularity say using finite state machine, but you can do it uh, using context-free languages. So it's uh, it's a famous example for the students who studied uh, theoretical computer science. Uh, but uh, it's actually like a very similar with uh, neural networks. Uh, uh, we did actually invent some uh, some special architecture that can learn like these type of regularities, and uh, that's because it doesn't have the memory. Uh, just in this uh, like a hidden layer, as, as it's typically done in the recurrent network, uh, but it uh, it learns to control the memory that is uh, that is having some sort of topology. So there are some notion of uh, of items being on top of the stack or like uh, at the bottom of the stack and somewhere between. And the stacks are actually like inflatable, like uh, at least in the mathematical version of the model, you can easily like uh, see that you can be putting. Uh, like uh, more and more items on top of the stack. It's uh, it's kind of um, like in the end uh, a special version of the hidden layer, uh, which uh, just like uh, has again like a topology over the items instead of uh, like uh, being fully connected as, uh, as is the baseline the normal recurrent network. And uh, then uh, it works in such a way that the hidden layer uh, actually computes an action that will be perform performed performed uh, with the stack, uh, so that. Uh, you can, for example, uh, push some value on top of the stack, or you can pop some value out, uh, um, or you can just not modify the stack in the current step uh, at all. And of course, uh, uh, the idea was not to use just a single stack for the model, but to use uh, many stacks, uh, and then see if we will train this model using stochastic gradient descent, uh, because everything uh, ended up being differential and continuous in our version, which is like uh, the details are described in this paper that are, uh, I'm citing at the bottom. But we wanted to see whether it will be able to solve uh, the tasks uh, for which like it seems that naturally you would want to be like using some, some memory that, uh, that you can expand on demand. And uh, it kind of worked, although it was not easy at all. Uh, we could... Uh, uh, we could learn tasks uh, that uh, normal recurrent networks or LSTM networks uh, didn't learn uh, to generalize from. Like, uh, like in these cases, you learn, for example, some memorization tasks uh, using uh, short examples, and then you test uh, the same model whether it actually can solve examples that are longer, but with the same regularity. Uh, the kind of like most extreme example in our paper was this binary addition, where we are showing the uh, uh, like uh, this, uh, this uh, like uh, training sequence that is algorithmically generated. It contains uh, uh, like some some equations where you just uh, sample randomly some two binary numbers, then you add uh, them together, and this is what the language model observes. So the language model just by seeing like thousands and thousands of these examples by just predicting the next token without actually knowing at all whether it's just observing the randomly generated number or the the result of the addition just by trying to minimize uh, the entropy, uh, the, the language model actually did learn to solve the, 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 this task, this binary addition. It did learn actually the algorithm of like adding uh, numbers together. Uh, we used like 10 stacks and uh, it learned on its own that it has to store the first number somewhere in the stacks and then store the second number and then switch to some other mode where it's using this carry over. A uh, bit, uh, and then it actually solved the task. Also, we we actually had to help it by just uh, uh, demanding the the result to be written backwards because then it's much easier for the stacks. That's just showing that uh, we didn't really like build some 
some universal algorithm learning uh, machine, but uh, but we just could uh, solve uh, some tasks that normal language models, normal neural language models, would just have no chance to solve. Uh, of course, this can go further, and we can be wondering what are like uh, simpler regular regularities, for example, in language uh, that current models uh, do not capture. And certainly, I would uh, see many examples that are related to memory. Uh, and then the question is, how do we actually develop uh, better models? How do we how do we uh, like implement the memory in our models so that uh, so that uh, for example, the neural network just operates uh, with this long term memory? instead of like having the hidden error state as, as, uh, as being the, the memory state. I think that's, uh, that's still like a future research. Uh, I think these type of models, which actually like quite a few groups at, uh, at uh, that time wanted to work on the same things. Uh, uh, so there was more papers than just the stack RNN that was coming from other groups like, uh, like uh, DeepMind and OpenAI and Google, Facebook. Uh, but it kind of died out because it was uh, quite clumsy to make it work. It was difficult and uh, uh, who knows, actually, maybe we were just trying to solve this uh, memory issue in too much like brute force way and uh, maybe there's actually a simpler solution. And uh, well, um, I actually think that there's another like interesting way to think of uh, these uh, mathematical properties of, this, of these models that we are using. Uh, uh, if we look in the area that's called complex systems, uh, uh, it sounds complex, but it's actually quite simple. The main idea here is that we started some simple models uh, where we iterate uh, some simple function on the state of these models, uh, like again and again. Uh, you can think of Game of Life, if you if you know that example, I will be showing animation later. But uh, the complexity is actually not something that you describe, uh, something that is not present in the starting state of the of the system. It's not present in, the, in this uh, transition function, in the rules of the system. Uh, everything is simple, but just by this iterative application of the same simple thing again and again, you end up with uh, with uh, with some structures that uh, uh, appear to be complex, although they are a result uh, uh, of uh, some like uh, like more like uh, emergent behavior that uh, uh, just uh, happens on its own somehow. Like uh, actually, there's a lot of uh, like even like physicists uh, who are excited about this um, idea of complex systems and they would even see that maybe the whole universe is a complex system in a sense that uh, you can start with something very simple in the beginning and just uh, by iteratively applying some basic uh, like uh, rules of physics uh, maybe that's uh, that's how uh, we ended up uh, to be living in this world that's looking actually quite complex to us with, uh, with a lot of uh, different uh, things around uh, that were not present uh, at the, the starting uh, point of the universe. Uh, well, I think that we can even see language as the complex system because uh, language is also kind of like a, like a, maybe in the beginning very simple, but just by iteratively applying the same rules uh, again and again, we have a lot of this emergent behavior and you can have new ideas that you can form, new words, uh, and um, the whole language is actually evolving. It's not a static, uh, uh, static uh, system that you can just describe by a fixed number of rules. Uh, but uh, it's like ever changing, ever evolving, uh, growing system. You can invent new words and so on. Um, I think uh, from some definitions of uh, how life is defined, you can even see uh, like uh, language itself as being some form of uh, artificial life, which maybe maybe sounds a bit too crazy, but there is actually like uh, artificial life, uh, like a uh, uh, research uh, direction and actually artificial life uh, conferences are happening every year and this year it will be happening in Prague actually in the summer uh, well only online but uh, but still and uh, and people from this community at least some of them would actually see uh, a language as, uh, as being kind of like life uh, so I think that's uh, it's like a, a lot of like a philosophical question uh, philosophical like ideas uh, at once again as I said like uh, there were there were like uh, people coming from all kinds of directions who, who were interested in in complexity and uh, among the physicists, uh, for example, I can see that uh, the, um, the like uh, uh, the person who did uh, discover quarks and later did uh, then the Nobel Prize, uh, Murray Gilman, um, like uh, later in his career, became interested in complexity and uh, uh, did create uh, the Santa Fe Institute uh, that actually studies uh, complexity and. Uh, Mm, there was actually a lot of other people, like including the ones who are interested in AI, who are working in this institute. Uh, and uh, well, <clears throat> why should we actually care about all this? Well, 
because if we want to actually have uh, again like this uh, intelligent language models that I was talking about in the beginning, something like this uh, this AI type uh, of, uh, of language models that can answer the questions and that can learn all kind of regularities, uh, maybe instead of like trying to hard code all this knowledge into these systems, we can uh, approach it from a different point of view by by creating models that have the potential to actually evolve into this complexity. Uh, so a few more examples like uh, what is complex, what is simple, like it's actually uh, like a basic question that many of you may actually have. Uh, uh, there's actually no clear definition and uh, if you would uh, go over it, you would find that uh, people did write whole books, like, uh, like for example that Mary Gellman that I was mentioning that uh, write uh, this Quark and Jaguar book uh, where he tried to define complexity and from different point of views. Uh, most of them, if not all, have uh, some issues like that they may be not computable for the same reason as uh, minimum description length is not computable. Uh, so it's actually a difficult uh, question on its own, but uh, intuitively, which is the best uh, that we can do so far, we can see that uh, uh, the picture on the left here, the checkboard is, uh, is not very complex because it's very regular and has short description length. Uh, and the picture on the right, uh, Maybe has also short description line because it's actually a fractal for um, which is generated by a short computer program, but somehow looks uh, more interesting because uh, there are like these new shapes uh, that can keep appearing and uh, somehow looks more complex. Uh, well, we try to work on it uh, with a couple of students at CERC, uh, like here in Prague, and uh, like uh, you can think. Uh, Again, like uh, the, mm, the game of life has been another like example of this complex behavior where we start with something simple and then you end up with uh, increasing amount of patterns. Uh, and we try to actually find automata where the complexity would be growing. We did randomly sample a lot of uh, 2D solar automata with like two or three or four states. Uh, and then we defined our own metric, which is more described uh, described in detail in this, uh, in this paper. Uh, and we did try to find automata which will have actually quickly growing the structured complexity. And uh, these are the examples of the automata that we did find. Uh, some of them actually look kind of like a game of life, but uh, while a game of life was manually like uh, manually described by its creator, in our case, we just uh, defined the complexity metric and then we did uh, uh, choose uh, from a huge, uh, so a huge set of automata, the ones that, uh, that seem to be evolving. Uh, so we didn't actually hard code the rules. Uh, and uh, it's actually looking kind of like a game of life, but again, we can do the same for like 3D automata or 1D automata with whatever number of states. Uh, so that was quite uh, quite interesting uh, for us. Uh, we also try to uh, like develop a technique that can classify the automata because uh, uh, even in the previous example, if I would show you the typical behavior, um, that would be quite boring because it would be looking like white noise, like 99% of the automata that you randomly sample will uh, will be behaving chaotically which uh, which uh, really like looks like white noise nothing interesting is happening uh, some fraction of the automata will be uh, on the other hand looking very boring like all the activity in the state uh, space will very quickly die up die out uh, and uh, the remaining class uh, is the interesting one where actually you have this growing complexity where some new structures seem to be appearing over time and that's again like a shown in these uh, in these figures uh, and in this uh, in this paper uh with barbara utsova we did uh, come up with a technique that can actually uh distinguish uh, these automata automatically into these three classes either the boring class or the chaotic class or the or the complex class uh, it's, it's, it's it has been published at this artificial life conference uh, last year so for the conclusion uh well i did present maybe some philosophical ideas uh, maybe too much uh, but uh, but i think that uh, if we want to advance uh, in language modeling further and not just by training bigger models uh, but uh, um, by actually inventing some new techniques that can learn from the same amount of data more than the previous techniques then we should be thinking about like uh, what the current models are doing um, like insufficiently uh, and what could be the types of mathematical models, uh, like uh, forms of mathematical models that would have properties uh, that the current models do not have. Like uh, if you look at uh, the main difference between say engrams and uh, neural networks, then uh, neural networks can do very well the clustering of the histories, which uh, engrams are simply not capable of. Uh, and I think that uh, we should be looking at the next step, like looking at what uh, 
what the neural networks are not at all capable of, and then coming up with models that uh, can actually model this uh, this type of uh, this type of regularity. And I think that what I was showing in the in the second uh, part of the presentation, either these uh, these uh, neural networks that learn to operate uh, with a memory that has a topology, uh, or these models that are actually uh, kind of like this complexity is spontaneously arising. That uh, all these can be like uh, interesting. Uh, replacements in the future for, for neural networks because they have properties that uh, neural networks do not have. Even if you can actually see that uh, like the silver automata that I was showing uh, at the end, uh, they can be seen as a special version of uh, say recurrent convolutional networks with stepwise activation function. That's uh, that's all nice, but uh, there's actually quite a few more things to be said about it. But uh, if you take normal neural network, it will really behave uh, in this chaotic regime. There will be no complexity uh, increase and uh, to give maybe one more motivating example, if you think about say text genera generation that uh, became so popular nowadays, uh, uh, then uh, you can generate like uh, well, stories and sentences from neural network language models. Uh, I think I, I had the first implementation of that uh, in the world actually in that uh, recurrent network language modeling toolkit that uh, I was describing. It was uh, Already like open source in 2010 because I was showing these uh, text generation examples uh, quite a bit uh, back then. But what I observed uh, was that if you try to get something interesting out of these models, for example, by generating a lot of text and then retraining the model on top of this text, then you will actually not really ever get to something interesting. Uh, you, you will either degrade the model that it will just reinforce the same sentences that it will just keep generating the same thing again and again by training it on what it generated uh, or it will stay at best uh, the same so the distribution uh, will basically not really change uh, or if you would want to uh, build models that can keep generating new and sensible texts and get kind of like better while doing it uh, which uh, people actually are capable of this then uh, I think that we would have to think of these models that are actually, again, like uh, something new and sensible structured uh, can emerge uh, as in these evolving uh, complex systems. Uh, uh, just to explain why humans would be able to do it, just imagine that you learn basics of some language, then you can write a book in that language, and then you can write uh, yet another book uh, that can actually extend the ideas in the first book. And uh, if you would have infinite amount of time and energy, you can actually keep writing uh, forever new books where you would be inventing new words, new concepts, uh, and just uh, creating your own world in the language. Uh, well, we are capable of that. Uh, our current uh, version of neural, uh, neural language models uh, are not capable of it. So there is a potential to create some new generation of uh, mathematical models that can um, like model this type of complexity and uh, I give here like a couple of ideas uh, in what direction we can be looking at, uh, but certainly there's uh, much more to discover. And uh, whenever we improve the language modeling technology, we get like a very interesting uh, outcome. Like uh, we could have seen that neural networks that uh, completely like uh, reshape how Google Translate works. Uh, uh, it's very useful, and I believe that uh, once we develop the next step, it will be even like exponentially more useful than, than currently language models are. So thanks for the attention. That's a uh, well presentation, and uh, we can we can uh, go for the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think it was a very interesting. Uh,